Are you resisting the Holy Ghost? Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost, as did your fathers. God is not a man, and he does not live in a building built with hands. The veil has been rent. God is a spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Hey everyone, welcome to Zuriel Ministries. Thank you for coming by today. Stick around, uh, it's going to be an amazing teaching. I hope that this resonates with you guys. I'm going to be speaking very openly and honestly. Um, and I'm just going to take you through what the Lord was speaking to me. And uh, hopefully it's helpful to you. Hopefully it opens up a door of understanding. Hopefully it's going to change something. Um, and I pray that it will by the power of the Holy Spirit who is leading in all, you know, all that we do. Stick around. If you enjoy the teachings, please like, subscribe and hit that bell icon. It definitely does help us. We need to reach people with the word of God. It's the only thing that's going to save their souls is Jesus Christ, the word of God. Hallelujah. All right, let's get into it. So what has brought me to, to make this video today? Well, as a minister of Christ, I deal with a lot of different people around the world. And recently, there have been a lot of people who are professing believers uh, who are not necessarily living a life led by the Holy Spirit. They are not living the life that is written in the scripture. They're not being led by the Spirit. They're not walking by the Spirit. And in many cases, they are, in fact, outright denying the Spirit um, and quenching the Holy Spirit, uh, which begs the question, have they ever truly received the Holy Spirit? So today we're going to dive into this. The second uh, reason for me to make this video today is because on a personal level, in my prayer time today, I was seeking God to know uh, to get a, to, to, to receive an answer about a question that I have in my heart, in, in, in my spirit that I want answered from God, which is this. Um, the Trinity can be a very complex topic and uh, a lot of people shy away from it or try to reason out with their intellect. But before we get into that, I just want to say this to you. God is all about the heart. And you can find this in the book of Acts where it is really uh, full. You can just see a lot of um, occurrences of a focus on being in one accord, of a focus on being, uh, you know, that the heart, it's all about the heart with God, in one heart, in one accord, in agreement with one another and with God. And so it is so very important for us to understand that there is simplicity in Christ. And before we get into this topic, I want everybody to understand that Truly, God is about your heart. Does that mean we can throw away the scripture? Does that mean that we, can't, we, we don't need to stand on the scripture? Absolutely not. God forbid. God forbid. We must live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. We must take all of scripture because all of scripture is given for instruction in righteousness. All of it. Not some of it, but all of it. So God forbid. We cannot throw it away. But there is simplicity in Christ. And God is all about your heart. If your heart is aligned with his character, nature, will, and is surrendered to him, then that is where we need to be. So on the note of what I was experiencing with God and what I was praying this morning, it was along the lines of the Holy Spirit and us being able to worship God and, and, and pray to the Holy Spirit. So the first thing, how it came about, was I was listening to a song uh, a worship song that is called uh, The True Almighty God by Nicopolitis. And in that song, there is a verse where it says, Worship the Son of God, Jesus Christ. Glory to the Holy Spirit will rise. And it got me thinking, you know, um, is it right for us to pray to the Holy Spirit? Or... Is there only one way to pray? And that's how Jesus showed us in Scripture when one of his disciples asked him. So that was a question that I had. Is it okay for us to glorify the Holy Spirit? So I'm going to give you insight into both of these questions. All right, let's get into the first question, which is related to, or the first topic, which is related to the Christians and whether or not they've received the Spirit, being led by the Spirit, 
so on and so forth. So first thing I want to say is there are many professing Christians that claim to be worshippers of God, but uh, they deny, suppress, or even bury, or perhaps they are just completely ignorant um, of the truth that God is a spirit, and God must be worshipped in spirit and in truth. There is no other way to worship him. Now, let's quickly break that down, all right? What does it mean, and why is it that God can only be worshipped in spirit and in truth? Well, at the time of Jesus' death, there was a dark cloud that came over. There was an earthquake that even ruptured the graves and the tombs there. A great earthquake. And then the veil on the most holy place in the temple, separating the Holy of Holies from the inner court, where only the high priest could enter, was torn from top to bottom. Why? Because the manifest presence of God, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, no longer dwelled in that building made with the hands of men. But from that moment, everything changed because Jesus had finished the work that he had been sent for. The word of God made flesh had finished his work of reconciliation for mankind. And from that moment, the Spirit of God no longer resided in a temple built with hands. That's the first thing. All right, so many people are professing that they worship God, whether they're ignorant or whether it's for some other reason or whether they're suppressing the truth in their unrighteousness, whatever it may be, uh, they're denying that God is a spirit. Okay. Now, this leads us to denial or quenching, grieving of the Holy Spirit. Okay. And we are commanded, we are commanded not to grieve the Holy Spirit. We are commanded not to quench the Holy Spirit. So before we get into that, it begs the question, have we ever truly then received the Holy Spirit? How can we know? How can we know if we've received the Holy Spirit? Well, the Holy Spirit is God himself. And the Holy Spirit is the one who does what? Comforts us, who leads us into all truth, who causes us to love what God loves and hate what God hates. Now you see the carnal mind, as the scripture tells us, is at enmity with God. It is hostile towards God. The carnal mind cannot know the things of God. And we see that in Nicodemus and his interaction with Jesus in John chapter 3. Nicodemus was a leader of the Jews. He was a very educated man in the Old Testament scriptures, the Torah, the Tanakh, in all of their scriptures, the prophets and the law. And he came to Jesus by night, and while he was sitting there, Jesus was telling him, you must be born again. He said, you will not see the kingdom of God unless you are born again. And then he said, what, can a man enter into his mother's womb the second time and be born? And Jesus said, he didn't answer that question, but he moved on and repeated himself now in another way. He said, unless you are born of water and of the Spirit, you will not enter into the kingdom of God. And then he went on to tell Nicodemus that he has told uh, Nicodemus of carnal things and he cannot grasp them or believe them. How is it then that he expects to understand the spiritual things? Because the spiritual things cannot be known by the carnal mind, but they are spiritually discerned. The things of God are spiritually discerned. You see, so we have to be born again. We have to receive the Spirit of God. How are we born again? We must repent, believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that God raised Him from the dead. He conquered death in the grave, ascended to the right hand of the Father, and that He will come back in all His glory with the heavenly host behind Him to pour out wrath upon the children of disobedience and reconcile those who have obeyed Him and loved Him and become His children into everlasting life with him in his presence. And when he ascended to the right hand of God, he sent the Holy Spirit to be with us. So we must repent, believe in Jesus, put our trust in him, not our self-righteousness. And then uh, uh, we must be baptized in water and by the Spirit of God, by the Holy Spirit. Why? Good enough reason. Jesus did not need to be baptized. He is the way he did it so that we know the way. The way is to be baptized in water and receive the Holy Spirit. So we must be born again. So 
when we deny that God is a spirit, then we deny the Holy Spirit working in our lives. So let's assume that we have the Holy Spirit. Now the Holy Spirit cannot work in us because we are quenching the Spirit of God because we are denying that He is a spirit. We are denying that we must worship Him in spirit and in truth. And thereby we begin to quench the Spirit. So the next question is, how do we quench the Spirit of God? The Lord has given me three things to share with you. So the first is unbelief. In the Old Testament, the Israelites, it says, did not enter into the promised land because of what? Unbelief. We can find this in Hebrews chapter 3, chapter 4. And it speaks about the Israelites not entering into the promised land because of what? Their unbelief. What is unbelief? It's a grave sin to God. It is literally saying, God, I do not trust you. God, I do not believe you. I do not believe what I've seen you do, and I do not believe that you're going to keep your word and be faithful. That's unbelief. It's a lack of faith. And a lack of faith in front of God is a grievous sin. So one of the reasons uh, uh, that we will, or one of the ways in which we will grieve the Holy Spirit, or uh, quench the Holy Spirit, quench the ability to hear His voice, quench the relationship we have with God, is through unbelief. We have to have faith. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 says, those who come to God must believe that He is. Believe. And number two, that He is a rewarder of them who diligently seek Him. But you have to believe. You see, the Bible says it is impossible to please God without faith. Because we have received eternal life through Jesus Christ. By what? By grace through faith. Faithlessness is the opposite of faith. Unbelief is the opposite of faith. And thereby it is against God's will. It is a sin in God's sight. And it is what causes us to quench the Holy Spirit in our lives. So today I want to pray for anybody out there. If you have been in unbelief, we're going to ask the Lord to help us here. Heavenly Father, I ask you right now in the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, to touch the hearts of the people that are watching this. And if there's anybody out there, Lord, who is convicted now at this moment that they are living in unbelief, that they have quenched your spirit, that they have grieved your spirit in the sin of unbelief, Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus, grant them repentance, my God. Bring that conviction into their lives. And Lord, set them free this day. Fill them with faith, my God. I ask you for faith in their lives, in the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Amen. So, moving on to the second point. So, number two, disobedience. Now, what you've got to understand about disobedience is that we find it in the Old Testament in Deuteronomy chapter 28. And we've got to understand that there is a law at work. And just like the law of gravity, it doesn't matter how much I want to believe that gravity does not exist. I can believe that this pen will not fall. No matter how much I believe it, the law does not change. The pen will still fall because it is a law that is established. And so there are laws that God has established. And one of those laws is found in Deuteronomy chapter 28. Obedience begets a blessing. Disobedience does not only negate the blessing, but it also begets a curse. This is the word of God. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. This is what the Bible tells us. That for obedience, when we obey God, we will walk in blessings. But when we disobey God, we will have curses. There will not only be an absence of blessings, but a presence of curses in our lives. So, we must walk in obedience to our God. When we walk in obedience, then we will receive blessings. And this brings us back to what we were saying in the beginning about the heart. Is your heart right with God? Do you love God because He's God? Do you love God because He is worthy? of being loved. He is worthy because He is the one who created everything, even us. He is the one who sustains the breath in our very lungs, the breath that I'm speaking to you with right now. Do you love Him out of a pure heart because He is God? Or 
do you love God because he's going to bless you? Uh, because you're looking for fame or you're looking for riches or you're looking for some other external blessing from God. Do you love the blesser or are you chasing blessings? Is your heart pure with God? Because the Bible says that the pure in heart will see God. Amen. So disobedience is the second thing that will hinder the Holy Spirit in our lives. It's the second thing that's going to quench the Spirit, the second thing that's going to grieve the Holy Spirit. And what is disobedience exactly? Well, simpler word for disobedience, we can just say sin. Anything where we are disobeying God is sin because it's contrary to His perfect will. And He is perfect, He is holy, He is just, He is righteous, He is justified in all that He does. Because he's God. He's not like men. He is a spirit. He is the everlasting spirit from everlasting to everlasting. So we have unbelief and we have disobedience. Now the third thing that the Lord has given me to share today is the works of the flesh. Now the works of the flesh, what we've got to understand here is from Galatians chapter 5. What Paul teaches us there. He says that, you can read this. I would encourage you to read the whole chapter, but I'm just going to read, oh, I'm just going to give you what he's saying from around verse 16. And it says, if you walk in the Spirit. Now, notice the language, walk in the Spirit. What does that mean? It means to have your every step in the Spirit of God, to live there, to be led by the Spirit, to walk in the Spirit. If we walk by the Spirit, if we walk in the Spirit, then we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. You see? We will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Because, he goes on to say, the spirit and the flesh, they are at war. They are lusting against each other all the time. And they are fighting for you, your attention. The flesh is fallen in nature. And the spirit of God is what makes us a new creation, renews the spirit of our mind, gives us a new heart with new desires, causes us, God's spirit causes us to love what God loves and hate what God hates. The flesh is the exact opposite. So the works of the flesh are always contrary to the spirit, you see. And we cannot walk in the flesh and the spirit at the same time. If you are walking in the flesh, you are denying the spirit. And if you are walking in the spirit, you are denying the flesh. And we are commanded to crucify the flesh. We must die to our desires and live to God's. That's what it means to walk in the Spirit. So, the third being the works of the flesh. Well, now, what are the works of the flesh? Let me share with you. I'm going to put it up on screen right now. There are four places in the Scripture that I want to share with you. And you can read through them here on the video. If you want to pause it, pause it and have a look. Um, but you will find them in Ephesians chapter 4, Galatians chapter 5, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and Proverbs chapter 6. I'm not going to go through them. You can take your time to work through them. But what I want to say to you is this. If you are walking in the flesh, if any of these things are present in your life in any way, shape, or form, then you can be sure that you are walking in the flesh. If you are walking in the flesh, how can you worship God? Because you can only worship God in the Spirit. Those who worship God must do so in spirit and truth. And so we cannot worship God in our carnal mind, with our carnal mind, or in our flesh. It is impossible. God is not a man. He is a spirit. The everlasting spirit. The Holy Spirit. The set-apart spirit. Amen. All right. So, there you have it. This is um, the address that I have to Christians who are denying the Spirit. Now, finally, what I want to say to you on this note is we need to understand something. That God is that Spirit who is from everlasting to everlasting. God is a spirit. And if we want to worship him, we must worship him in spirit and in truth. 
And that's what we saw earlier. When we had a look at Acts chapter 7, I'm going to read for you now from verse 48. And uh, we're going to go to verse 51. I will also put it up on the screen. Here we go. So, verse 48. Howbeit the Most High dwells not in temples made with hands, as says the prophet, referring to Isaiah. And it's written in Isaiah 66, as it is written here in verse 49. Heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. What house will you build me, says the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Has not my hands made all these things? Now listen to the rebuke of the Lord. And I want to encourage you, hear what is being said here in verse 51. Because this is the case with a lot of the people sitting in church every Sunday. We are sitting there, but we are dead in our spirit. We have quenched the spirit of God. And if you hear this message today, I pray that it will shake you, that it will wake you, that it will cause you to know that God is a spirit and he must be worshipped in spirit and truth. Verse 51, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. So today I want to say to you, if you have received the Holy Spirit, if you have been born again, why do you resist the Holy Spirit? God wants to do a wonderful work at this time in this earth. And He wants to work through us. He wants to raise up an army here of servants, of disciples, of warriors for His kingdom. But He cannot do that if we do not allow Him to work in us and through us by His Holy Spirit. So today I want to encourage you, do not deny, do not resist, do not quench, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Let go of your stubbornness, your stiff neck and uncircumcision in your heart and your ears. Receive the Word of God in your ears today as we are speaking here and let it stir up the Spirit of God in you, in your heart, so that you might be revived by His Spirit and live unto God. Amen. Glory be to God. So that then brings us back to John chapter 4. And I'm going to read for you where Jesus goes and He's speaking to the woman at the well. Jesus said unto her, now this is after she said to Jesus, she said, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, worshipped in this mountain, she said. And ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. You see, she's talking of specific locations where God is, that he must be worshipped in those specific locations. Note Jesus' response to her. He says, Woman, believe me, the hour comes when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour comes, and now is, when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeks such to worship Him. God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must, not should, must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So today, brothers and sisters, everybody out there who's watching this, I want to encourage you that you must be born again. Without the Spirit of God, you cannot worship God. It is impossible because the carnal mind cannot know the things of God, nor does it want to know the things of God. If you have not found a desire for God, if you have not found a conviction to turn away from sin, then I encourage you, seek the Lord. Today is the day of salvation. Tomorrow is not promised to any man. Notice the intention of this video. Notice the tone of my voice. I could be doing a thousand other things right now, but I'm sitting here in obedience to God, making this video because I truly love God and I love you guys. And I want you 
to enter into eternity, into God's rest. Because the alternative is a thought that should put the fear of God in anyone. The Bible says all liars will have their part in the lake of fire. Forget every other kind of sinner. All liars. It says the fearful will have their part there. Forget everything else. So we must be born again so that we can see the kingdom of God. We must be born of water and of the Spirit so that we can enter into the kingdom of God. Now you might be asking, you might be asking, brother, how can I enter? How, what must I do to be saved? To be saved, what you must do according to the scripture is you must repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. That means baptized in water. You must repent of your sin. And I want to explain repentance after I give you the, the, the formula. You must repent. You must be baptized. And when you are baptized, you must receive also the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit can only be received by the laying on of hands of the elders or by asking God. So ask God. If you have not yet received the Holy Spirit and you have repented and you have been baptized, ask the Lord. He is faithful. How much more will he not give good gifts to his children if they ask him if how earthly fathers and us as earthly fathers will give our children good gifts, being evil, as the Bible says. So uh, now what is repentance? Very quickly, repentance is not to walk in your sin. So let's say this direction is sin. Uh, repentance and forgiveness are different. Okay. I'm walking this way. I ask God to forgive me. So I'm walking in my sin, doing whatever I'm doing. And then I say, oh, Lord, I'm contrite. Forgive me for doing this sin. And then I get up and I keep walking that direction. Is this repentance? Absolutely not. God forbid. Repentance is, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I grieve God in this way that I'm walking. And I make a decision. It's a change of heart and a change of mind for me to change my direction. God is here. Sin is there. And I make the active choice to turn my back on my sin and to set my eyes on Jesus Christ, his kingdom, his righteousness. And even though I might not be able to keep walking this way, I make a choice. I choose God and I believe by faith that he will help me to keep walking. Hallelujah. This is repentance. So repent. Be baptized in water, full immersion in water. Receive the Holy Spirit. I hope this has been a blessing to you. And uh, we hope to see you next time. If you enjoyed the video, please consider liking, sharing, subscribing, hitting the bell icon. It all helps us to get the true word of God out there in front of people like you to bring them to Christ. God bless you.